Hello everyone, all of you here in class and those that will be watching the video at a later date. Uh, we're in First Principles in Resurrection Life, Lesson 3, entitled Church Life. And so, as we were saying a few minutes ago before class, just so much great material from the Word of God in these books. They're very, very rich. We want to jump into a little bit about church life. And honestly, since I was 12 years old, I got saved at 12 years old here at the church, at a church camp, came back, got very involved in youth ministry and became youth leadership in my early teens and have really engulfed my entire life in church life. And that's just what we have done, surround ourselves with, uh, weren't involved in a whole lot of other things as a teenager, a young adult, and throughout my life have just fully given ourselves to the kingdom. And for us, having a call to ministry, church life was our life and continues to be our life. Uh, some people say you stay incredibly busy and you've got to be, you know, how do you keep from being burned out? But for, I guess for me, being called into ministry and this type of ministry, uh, church life feeds me. It doesn't take things away. So I get energized in opportunities like this to share God's word and to share with others. And so we want to look at the uh, the, the proper order when it comes to church life tonight. And the top of page 21 is where we'll begin. It says, there is one church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many different denominations, but ultimately there's only one universal church. And so probably uh, in, even in a small group, many of us had different denominational backgrounds growing up. And if you drive through this city, it's been said that there's a hundred churches in this local community and, and most of them different denominations, different ideas. And it makes you wonder, is it, is it okay in the heart of God for churches just to live by what they believe and the way they believe it? And can churches do pretty much whatever they want to do? Kind of come up with their own set of uh, standards and rules and just say, hey, this is what we're going to do as our church. And some people may believe that, but ultimately... God is a God of order. And so even though we may have different pers perspectives, maybe things become more important to us than others. At the end of the day, we're all held accountable to the truth of the Word of God. And really in the church, the government and order of the church should be patterned after biblical government and order. And so there's some non-negotiables. Now, I believe it's okay to have different denominations, and I believe God is a God of flavor, and so not all of us think alike, not all of us see things as the, the greatest priorities in life, but yet if we're centered as believers, united in Christ, and we're centered on the Word of God, you can see the same object through different lenses or perspectives. And so it's okay to have different denominations, but in every gathering of people, there has to be some core values and truth that agree with the Word of God because God is a God of order. And so these need to be established, and there needs to be order in the church. It says in that second chapter, throughout the Scriptures, we find that order is an integral part of God's design. As God spoke the universe into being, He established natural order in the world, the plant and animal life, the lights, the nature of things in Genesis 1, 6 through 21. And God gave Moses a pattern for the tabernacle and its instruments in Exodus 25, 9. He spoke to Moses to count Israel in an orderly fashion in Numbers 1, 2 through 3, and to arrange the camp about the tabernacle in an orderly manner in Numbers 2 and verse 1. And so when the mixed multitude became too much for Moses to handle alone, he appointed 70 elders to rule and judge. And we find that in Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 17. So we see God established order in the family by creating the husband with the natural function as the head and the provider and the wife as the suitable helper. And in the heavenly vision of John, there's an order about the throne of God with 24 elders, their seat, seven lamps, the four beasts, and the worship in Revelations chapter 4. And so there is order to everything in God's domain, and he intends for the church to have order also. So order is very important to God. He, he is a, as a just and a righteous God. He holds us accountable for the Word of God. We don't just get a free pass because we're His child. We can do whatever we want to do. He, he has grace and mercy and an abundance of love, but there's also some order that He wants us to live by. Think of King David, 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Chronicles 15, 2. If you remember, King David became a king and he had a strong heart to go get the presence of God or the tabernacle of God and take it back to Jerusalem. And it says there in, fifth, in uh, chapter 15 and verse 2, David said, 
No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. This became a reality a little bit late for David. David got so excited about the presence of God and going after the ark of the covenant, that he takes some of his leaders, they all go down to find where the ark is, they build a cart, they put the ark, which is where the presence of God was dwelling, put it up on this cart, and it just makes good common sense. We've got a good long distance to Jerusalem, Let's build a really nice cart, put the presence on the cart. We'll drag the cart. We'll have some animals lead the cart. And we'll go back to Jerusalem celebrating. And God's presence will be once again among the people because the enemies of God had captured the ark, taken it out from, uh, from Israel. And so they've gone and got it back and they're celebrating. This is a great event of celebration. The presence of God is now going to be among the people of God. Only problem was they didn't remember the order of God. And so on their way back, quickly, they, the cart was shifted and the ark was about to come off. And so Uzzah reached out to stable the ark. And when he did, he touches it and he's killed instantly because of the power of God. And honestly, because they were doing something they should have never been doing. See, it's important that we have a clear understanding of the ways of God and the word of God so that we live in the order of God. And so they had just missed a key step. It had to be upon the shoulders of the Levites, and they had other men putting this thing on a cart and not carrying on their shoulders. They come back. He repents. He realizes what goes wrong. He calls for the, for the scriptures to be brought out so he could begin to study them and say, where did we go wrong? It becomes very clear that the presence of God is to be carried on the shoulders of the Levites. And so he, he, he re, reestablishes a plan and realizes, I know what I did wrong. I should have never built the cart. We should have never done it that way. I should have known better. I should have went to the source first and got God's instruction on how to walk this thing out, and then I could have done it properly. And so the good thing is David has enough sense not to abandon the mission totally, just to back up, get God's order, and then go do it the right way. And in our lives, the same thing applies. Sometimes we do things the wrong way, and it costs us. But that doesn't mean, well, been there, done that, got the t-shirt to prove it. I'll never do that again. And sometimes fear of failure will keep us from trying again. And fear of someone losing their life is another even greater measure. Like last time we did that, someone died. We're not going to go do that again. David said, God's presence is so valuable. We will risk it again. I just need a purpose to do it right. And we need a purpose to please God and do what he called us to do, but to just do it right. And so when they did it right, they get the presence of God back to Jerusalem Everyone celebrates. God's happy. They're happy. It's all because of the order of God. And that's something that we take very important here at the Heights Church. Uh, David's here tonight in the, in the group, and, and some of you may have been around a little while. Our church has a long history, and worship has always been a very big part of the Heights Church and a, and a priority. But even in worship, there's things that need to be in order. The Bible says that all things be done, but let them be done decently and in order. And there were seasons in church life that sometimes, even though our hearts were right, there wasn't the right order in, in a situation or a service. And so it becomes somewhat fleshly. If you've ever been in a, in a service where it goes from being very spiritual in the presence of God and to it becomes more centered around a man or, or a situation. Maybe someone grabs a microphone and all of a sudden the spirit is quenched and you're like, man, we were going somewhere until that person got up and I don't know where that rabbit trail's going, but I just felt like it all ended right there. Or maybe someone gets up and just, and, and takes a service in a wrong direction. And, and so we, we purpose hard here at the Heights Church and we transitioned and really became very intentional when we moved from our previous location into this building because we knew it was an opportunity to say, God, we want you to be seen and not us. We don't want anything that's fleshly. We don't want anything that brings us attention. We want to worship in a way that anyone from this community can come in and experience the presence of God. And so we have a desire to host God's presence. And so if something is a distraction, we try to, to, try to remove all distractions and make everything about him. And so in our worship, even though it's expressive and we have many instruments and we have lights, we never want it to become showy. We never want it to become distracting. And, and we monitor these things all the time. If something becomes uh, something that is seen, maybe someone's playing an instrument in a way that brings attention to themselves or singing in a way that brings attention to themselves. It's, we are not, this is not a concert. This is not about us. Say, look at me. 
We are a team, and ultimately, we're all worshiping uh, Jesus. Amen? And so we want Him to be the center of attention. And so we purpose to allow worship to happen freely and expressively, but with, in the background, some order to how things go so that it's all about Him and never about us. And so our worship connects us and connects, really connects heaven and earth. And in worship, we believe it's our submission unto His authority. He's the King. This is His kingdom. This church is not our kingdom. It's His kingdom. And so we come in a, in a, in a, in a position of submission into the authority, declaring He's King, and this is His kingdom. So look at page 22 when we talk about the rule, authority, and government of God. It has to be, we have to remember that it's not our throne. It's not our kingdom. He is the king and it's his kingdom. Psalms 145 and 13 says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Psalms 24, one says, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. And then Psalms 103, 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. And so ultimately it's God's kingdom he inhabits the universe and he rules over the universe. And I like to think about it like this. God is hands-on. He's the owner operator and he's not distant. He's not a million miles away just looking down at something that he wound up like a top and released and it's just freely going wherever it wants to. God is completely involved in everything that is happening today. Some people think, well, he just started it 6,000 years ago and just released it like a like what you see on TV when they click the first domino and now it's just doing what it was all set up to do and it's going to end at its final destination some thousand years later. No, he's right in the middle and involved with every detail. He knows your every thought. He knows your every in intention. He knows his heart's desire for you and he's constantly leaning into you and by his spirit speaking to you and guiding you and encouraging you the God of all of this is extremely personal and extremely involved in his kingdom. And it's great when the king is present in his kingdom. Who would want to serve a king that's always on vacation? Here's his kingdom, but the king's never here. There's his, his castle, there's his throne, but he rarely comes around here. He, who knows where he's at? That's not the God I serve. He's constantly in the presence of his people loves to dwell right in the middle of his people. And so he's a very hands-on God. Let's look at the conflict of the ages. So he's the God of authority. He rules over all, but he's also the God who understands how to release and delegate authority. Even before the creation of mankind, God in the heavenlies had set up, it's his kingdom, his dominion, his reign, but there was those who were given authority and responsibilities in heaven even prior to humanity. And, and it talks about the conflict of the ages on the bottom of page 22. And it gives the story of Ezekiel 28 and verse 11 when it's talking about the king of Tyrus. But it's actually the twofold story here. It's also talking about Lucifer or Satan in heaven before his fall. And so I want you to look at this, Ezekiel 28, 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. This is talking about Lucifer. And say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Check this out. So evidently there was a season of time or a spance when the garden of Eden was occupied by, we know, Lucifer and maybe part of heaven. That, that God is explaining, this is who you were. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, the topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper. So it speaks of Satan and Lucifer. And the reason we know that is if you continue to read Scripture, you'll, you'll see how this is the one who's talking about who is leading worship and is cast out of heaven. So in his beginnings, before he turns against God, he was created a very beautiful being, he was given authority, given freedom within the garden of God. He has gold and, and sapphires and turquoise and emeralds and all of these things upon. So he's a spectacle of God's handiwork. Look what I've created. This beautiful reflection of me that 
pipes out of his own body the sounds of God. Pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, if that were you, you would not want to mess that up, right? I mean, like, I'm a blessed man. I, 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 hindsight's always 2020 because that is you in the sense. And we'll talk about that in a moment. If we understood how miraculous and spectacular we are in the eyes of God, we would say, God, let me not mess this up. But he goes on to say, he had sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. So he has this spectacular uh, uh, being of all of these jewels and all of these incredible sounds and probably reflections, and I don't know the fullness of, but walking back and forth in front of the fiery flames. But by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. And so you see this, what's happening. You defiled the sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst." It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Pretty bad ending. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. This is his future. He has been entered into the fiery furnace, turned to ashes, and will be forever no more. Yet the world looks at him and, are, and is still terrified of him, although he's been stripped of all authority and all power. But this is, this is in the beginning, even before humanity, there's God's dominion, God's power, God's authority, and then one who rises up against his authority wants to take the glory of God for himself, wants to begin to have a sinful, wicked heart, and he's cast out of heaven to dwell uh, among men. And listen, mankind was created to be his replacement in heaven. But now it's not just going to be one, it's going to be many. And that was what God, was God's heart from the beginning of creation. I am going to create my church, my new body, to sit at my right hand and to be worshipers in my presence. And Maybe even to, you know, I haven't thought about it too deeply, but the Bible says we will receive crowns of honor and glory that will have jewels upon them. Here it talks about Lucifer when he was created, having all these beautiful stones and jewels. Why? Because God's, God is a God of light. And so we, we try to simulate a little bit maybe what heaven would look like in the glory of the rays of light that would come forth from God's presence. The reality is if we do what we're called to do, and if we receive the rewards God has for us, we show up in heaven with a crown of righteousness and a crown of all these beautiful stones so that in the presence of God, we become reflectors of his glory. I don't know about you. I don't want to show up in heaven with my Burger King crown on and there not be any stones in it. And everybody else be emitting these beautiful rays of reflection of God's glory. And I'm over there just like got a little bit of it's a slight bit of gold, but there's no diamonds and there's no emeralds and there's no sapphires. And you look over and say, man, you got in by the skin of your teeth. You know, there's nothing reflection, no, no reflection coming from you. I want God to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Look at that crown of righteousness placed upon him and look at the stones that have been given to him for all that he accomplished in my kingdom. And so we have been given that right from the very beginning. God wanted mankind to take Lucifer's place. Now, you know or should know that it didn't happen immediately because mankind, Adam and Eve, were somewhat attracted to this creature in uh, the tree or the fruit tree that when they went and began, she began listening to him, was deceived by him and ends up taking of the fruit, basically submitting herself underneath Satan's authority, giving up that right. And so now mankind's separated from God, not in their rightful place, 
And so God already in his heart knows what's going to happen, and he has a plan established through his son Jesus to reestablish or redeem us back to right relationship with the Father. And so that's what we see here in the top of page 24. God's plan of restoration began with the recreation of the earth. Man falls, yet God already has Jesus Christ in his plan for building his church through the manifold wisdom of God to be made known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places in Ephesians 3.10. In other words, the purpose of God will be demonstrated to all authorities in creation. Now we, it says the body of Christ, the church, now fills the void left by Lucifer's fall. We fulfill the prophetic role by speaking God's words of reconciliation to the peoples and nations of the world. We are a kingdom of priests who minister to our God, according to 1 Peter 2.9. And this is all in the middle of page 24. And then by taking dominion where we live, we extend the government of God and fulfill our kingly position. All the qualities and ministry functions that God bestowed on Lucifer in the beginning are now bestowed upon the church. The church is the full wisdom, and so what it talked about to him in his beginning, we are now the full wisdom according to Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, and Ephesians 3 and 10. So I encourage you to go back and take a deeper dive and look into what God says about us. We are perfect in beauty according to Ephesians 5, 27 and Revelations 21, 9 and 19, and we are the anointed of the Lord in power according to Acts 1, 8 and authority according to Ephesians 1, 20 through 23 in Revelations 1, 6. So everything that it says about Lucifer before his fall, God says over us as the children of God, having been redeemed, put back in right relationship with God. He takes what was given to him initially that he lost through sin and he brings it back in and he gives it to his children to fulfill that role. That means we stand before the throne of God in heaven. We bring worship and praise to him. We are taking that role as worshipers. So let's look at the purpose of government and, and uh, on the bottom of or bottom half of page 24. The purpose of government, there's four main things that government provides. And so it says there in Romans 13, 1 through 4, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. In other words, God, God calls and establishes prophets and apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers. These men or women that are placed into authority are put there by God. So he says, all authority is established by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. He says the law is for our good and authority is for our good, and it's established by God. And the way you're not afraid of authority is you do right. I don't know if you've ever uh, been, uh, early on when the seatbelt law first came into place, everybody was trying to learn how to put seatbelts on. And it was just, you know, you just didn't have that habit yet. And I remember finding myself pulling up to a red light or something and a police officer pulls up and, and I realize I don't have my seatbelt on. And, and I'm a rule follower and I, I'm not a risk taker. I like to do things right. And I would be a nervous wreck. Like, oh, what am I doing? I can't believe I didn't do that. The way, or, I, or have you ever had your inspection sticker out and you know it? When you don't know it, you're not paying attention. But once you realize it's out, and then you're always looking for that police officer because you haven't had time to go get it yet, and you're always thinking, oh, no, I'm about to get a ticket. Or, but when, when things are right, all that goes away. When your inspection's good, when your seatbelt's on, when you're obeying the speed limit. And I've got a lead foot, and I'm always in a hurry. And so I learned some years ago, the only way to keep from living like a nervous wreck is to set my cruise control for 30 miles an hour in town. You're like, are you serious? Absolutely. When I get into town, even in town, I put my cruise control on 30 or 35. Now, I've learned to deal with it because it can be a nuisance because traffic moves. In, but I, it's just kind of a mental check for me because especially coming in from out of town and it's clear in the mornings, I could buzz through town at 50 miles an hour and not realize it. 
not anymore. As soon as I get into town, I set my cruise for 35 or 40 or whatever it is. And until I have to stop at a red light, I'm on cruise control, keeping me in check. And then I don't have to live a nervous wreck. So government provides protection. Protection is a beautiful thing because if I live with the law present and I live under authority, that governing authority is there to protect me. Unfortunately, our nation maybe doesn't realize that anymore. They take away police officers, they release criminals, and they think everything's going to be okay. No, it's good to have a law. It's good to have law enforcement. They're there for our good. And I pray that God give them the grace to keep wanting to be law enforcement because it's very hard to want to go into that uh, field of business nowadays with all that they have to stand against. Second thing it provides is form. There needs to be structure and form uh, to a community, to a group of people. And so uh, government provides this form. It provides the outline, the, 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 the rules, the laws that we need to live by for our own good. And then it also provides function. And so now that law has been established and now a baseline has been established of how we should live, then how to function within that system becomes more clear. It's like stop signs and red lights and one-way signs. Okay, these are all a part of the, the closer inner working as we want government, we want structure, Therefore, we start having these smaller things like one-way streets and red lights and stop signs. It's all a part of the the, uh, form and then the function of how this is going to work out. And then ultimately, if we all abide by that government and that authority, it brings a great deal of unity. We're all doing life the same way for the same purpose. And so the church should understand the beauty of the law of God, the Word of God, submit ourselves to it so that we're in alignment and agreement, then we can walk in this great deal of fellowship and unity without conflict because we're all living under the same government, the same authority. And so let's look at page 25. It talks about unity. It's Christ that unites us. We are, we are united because we're believers. You're either a believer or an unbeliever. So it's being a believer that unites us. And, but even though we're united, we can be united and still be a little bit different or maybe see things a little different. I used an illustration before. In fact, I got it from Pastor Robert Morris of the water bottle. He said he was meeting with someone uh, years ago and, and that we, they, they were seeing things from two different perspectives. And God gave him the revelation that it's like a water bottle. Um, and the water bottle he had, uh, this one says purified water. I think the one he showed had pure life. And then the other side um, this, if, if a person's looking at this side of the bottle, they're seeing purified water. And, and so what do you see? I see purified water. But the person from this side of the bottle looking at the bottle sees, we would love to hear about your member's mark experience. Visit us at samsclub.com. That's what I'm seeing because that's what's written on this side of the bottle. What you're seeing on this side of the bottle says purified water. Does it make it different? No, it's still a bottle of water but I'm, I'm only getting the interpretation of the perspective, the side of it I'm seeing. What makes us beautiful as a people is when we come together and you from the other side say, hey, I, this is what I see over here. And you say, well, this is what I see over here. And, and everybody can see a perspective of the same. And then we come to a greater understanding of, of the whole. Does that make sense? And so God may reveal himself to you in a way and say, oh man, God is my comforter. And someone else, God is my peace. And someone else, God is my rock. Can I tell you, he's all of those things. He's not just one of those things. He's all of those things that make up who God is. And so it's a great illustration in Ezekiel chapter one of the four-faced beast that, that goes, that all move four different creatures, but all move in the same direction at the same time having seen different perspectives. It says, each facing a different way, yet in some way they touch. A man in front, a lion on the right side, an an ox on the left, and the eagle in the back. There's a wheel, and the spirit is in the wheel. Wherever the wheel goes, the creature goes. So there's four creatures the Bible talks about, all facing outward, all upon this wheel of the spirit of God, and yet this one creature sees this direction, and when God's ready, they all move in that direction. This, the one on the opposite side can't see it at all, but he trusts that God's moving in a direction he's not fully aware of, but because he's on the wheel, 
you could say he's in the wheel, so to speak. He's moving in that direction. The next time around, all of a sudden, God's moving back this direction, or he's moving left and he's moving right. It's okay for us to go in in those directions, even if we can't fully see it, if we're walking in unity, we're walking in the Spirit, and we trust God and trust one another. And listen, any of us have the opportunity to get out of bounds, and when we do, we should know it. We just walk. We just took a wrong turn. I don't feel the Spirit of God here. Let's go back to where we were and start over. But the beautiful thing about church life is we can walk in unity, even though maybe we not see it completely the same. We have being we're being led by the Spirit and grounded in the Word of God. Does that make sense? He goes on to talk about the structure of the body, Christ being the head, and us, you and I, making up the body of the church. And so regardless of who the pastor is, the pastor is the shepherd, the overseer, the lead elder of the church, but Christ is the head of the church. And so this is not my church. This is his church. I'm stewarding what belongs to God. This is God's house and he's the center of attention. And so I am just an an, an overseer, but I'm submitted under his authority, just like the rest of the church. So God delegates authority to lead and serve the church. Pastors, lead elders, shepherds is what they're called. But there's also apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers mentioned uh, as a part of the equipping of the body of Christ. doesn't mean one has more authority than the other. They just have different functions. And church life should be where all of those giftings are working together in unity under the same government, the same order or structure. So it goes on to talk about government and the individual. Can we as individuals submit to authority? It's a very important part of this lesson because ultimately, if we believe God is God, it's his kingdom and his dominion, his authority, then there has to come a a time in my life where I'm willing to submit to the authority of God. And then if God establishes authority, I have to be willing to submit to the authority that God has placed in my life as a part of being under his ultimate authority. And so I'll, I won't read all of this uh, tonight, but in essence, that's where, what we're covering in church life. And then it talks about discipline in church life, which can be one of the most difficult things leaders have to face because I'm, I don't like conflict. And in my mind, sometimes conflict creates opportunity for um, us to have conversations that are very hard to have. And I would rather just pray it through and maybe God take care of it than to have to confront things and deal with them. But ultimately, some things won't go away. And so conflict is a good thing if it brings a great resolution. And sometimes the only way that can happen is to engage in healthy conflict. And how can we be disciples if we're not willing to be disciplined? And and I want to be honest with you. We, not you, we as the church are weak in this area. We don't like discipline. We're honestly not even used to being disciplined in the church. We get by with so much. There's probably too much grace and mercy because God is a God of order and God has structure and God establishes authority so that we can bring healthy discipline that makes us better. And yet, because we're afraid in the church that if I bring discipline to someone, there may be rejection and they might leave and go somewhere else. We don't discipline them. Can I tell you what that creates? A bunch of spoiled, rotten brats that are going to do whatever they want to do. Listen, if you love your children, you discipline them, right? Children that are disciplined turn out to be, turn out to be great children. Children that never face discipline are usually very unruly children. So I don't think the church should be always breaking out the paddle, so to speak, but I think the church should love each other enough that, that those that God placed in authority should be able to personally and even privately, not always publicly, bring you aside and say, hey, I love you enough to tell you the truth. That sounded harsh, or that didn't come across right, or that attitude is probably not healthy. And, and, you, and, and we say, w- would that be possible? I think it's necessary if we're going to grow. Because those that I love the most are those that were willing to speak into my life and tell me the truth. I didn't like it when it happened, but I appreciated it later that they cared enough about me to tell me the truth. Because I have to look in the mirror and say, is there any truth in that? 
And if they're right, can I make some adjustments? Because I want to grow. And I have more respect for a person that will be honest and tell me the truth than someone that's, oh yeah, you're great. Everything's great. No, it's not. There's some things that are not right, but you're not strong enough as a leader to tell me the truth. And so as pastors, we probably can lean into it a little more. I purpose as a pastor, one of the pastors, to when I preach, preach the truth and use, illustra- and use illustrations that, that bring it home where I say, he's right, I'm wrong, I need to make adjustments. And I have people in my life that can tell me the same thing. I have a group of apost- elders and apostolic elders. So there's nine men that I subject myself to, to speak into my life and tell me the truth. And I ask them, hey, I, I'm going through this, but help me. Is, am I the problem? Because I, 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 honestly, I could be the problem. I might be looking at this through a totally wrong lens. And they love me enough that they would say, yeah, right now you're, it's you. They're doing it right. You're the one that's seeing it wrong. So these are important. Government and the individual, that's what we were talking about. Discipline in the church, there on the bottom of page 27. It's necessary. It's healthy. Let me end real quickly. I've gone over just a touch. Let me end real quickly with this church life on page 28. Sometimes there needs to be discipline to, to a brother or sister in the church. There's a healthy way to do it. In the middle of that page, when there's conflict and things need to be addressed, the Bible says, first of all, go alone and tell your brother or sister what they've done wrong, personally, privately. You see something as, a, as an authority in the church, you need to go to that person and you need to have that real one-on-one, private, respectful conversation that hey, I saw this and it's not right. I want to address it because I care about you. I love you. The second thing is, if he listens, you've gained your brother. And he says, thank you for being honest with me. I had a booger on my nose. No one else was telling me. You told me. Thank you. I appreciate that. The third thing is, but if he will not listen, take one or two brothers with you as witnesses the second time to bring it to their attention. The fourth thing is, if you will not listen to them, tell it to the church. Uh Uh-oh, where are we going with this? this? This is doctrine here. It says, hey, go privately to address an issue that they're sin in a brother's life. Hey, I see this. We need to address this. If he listens, you've gained a brother. If you not, take a few brothers with you as witnesses. Try to address it that way. If this person continues to cause problems within the church and is not willing to make a change, the Bible says address it publicly and tell the church, hey, George is not living right. George has asked everybody in this church for money and he doesn't need money, we've got to quit allowing that in the church. So if George comes to you for money, just know that 50 other people have already given him some, and that's not what we're here for. We've tried to help George. We've tried to get George a job. He doesn't want a job. He wants your money. We're going to put a stop to it. We're not doing it anymore. Is that okay to say? That's what it says here, right? I mean, like, let's not... And that's not all privately gone. I wish somebody would address that. No, it's addressed. Now, if he will not listen to the church, let him be to the church as an unbeliever. In other words, George, we've told you over and over again, this is not healthy. This is not God's way. This is not God's will. And you continue to do so. And I use that as a total random example. And I have nobody in mind when I say George. <laughs> if there's a George <laughs> that's listening to this lesson, you might be calling me out. No, I'm totally blank when I say that. But at the end of the day, George may have to go somewhere else because it's not healthy if he's not willing to change. It could be George selling drugs. <laughs> hey, I caught you selling drugs. We can't be doing that. Oh, he's still doing it. Let's take a few others. Okay. Hey, everybody, be careful. This guy has a problem. You don't want your youth getting around this situation. All right. If it's not going to change, he's got to go somewhere else because we're going to protect the health of church under authority. See what I'm saying? That's the beautiful part of being submitted under healthy church life. Let me pray for you as we've gone uh, about five minutes over. Father, thank you for your goodness, for lessons like this that bring us to the reality of truth, that you have order, you have structure, you're a God of government, and you're righteous. Help us to lead with righteousness and order and structure under your authority, with authority for the good of all of us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.